In this video, I'm going to go over the basics of interpreting graphs. In terms of how to make a graph, you're going to learn that more in the lab section. So those of you on the online course, you'll have a, uh, you'll have a whole thing on graphing and how to do it. Same thing for people taking the class uh, in, live and in person at VU or either at Lincoln is you will have um, it will be in your lab class the first couple days you'll discuss how to make graphs. So just to go over what graphs do, what they do is they allow us to take large amounts of data points that you collect from a study and to put it into a form that you can read it easier and interpret it easier. So it allows us to identify trends, relationships between things, and so on. So there are things though that you need to look for in a graph and that you need to understand when you're interpreting a graph or determining what a graph is telling you or what the data is telling you. So we're going to look at a couple graphs. Um, I see that there's two ways to interpret a graph. You can look at something very specific, be asked a very specific question and be able to answer it. But you also want to look at the graph as a whole and what information it gives you in total. So what I'm going to do here is show you a line graph. So this is a basic line graph. I'll go over the rules of graphing uh, quickly for you, but you'll go over it in more detail in lab. You need to have a title. Uh, you need to have both axes. All right, they need to be labeled, and so here's the amount of rain, and you have to have the units, which in this case is inches, and time is on this, on the x-axis, and that's obvious that it's months. So what you do is you just graph your points, and we have two lines here, so you have to signify the difference in a key between the two, that this is the amount of rainfall in Columbus, and this is the amount of rainfall in Atlanta. And so you have connect the points and here you have your data in a simple rate or simple way to read it. So one question that could be asked is again this is a very specific question is how much did it rain how many inches uh, did it rain in Columbus in May. So we know Columbus is the red line so we come to May we go up and it's approximately five and a half inches. So that's a very specific question. That's a very specific question about a specific point on the graph. Again, I could say what was the amount of rain that it, the amount that it rained in inches in Atlanta in May. And you would see right here, we go to May, that it's about 4.5, somewhere in that range, okay, somewhere in that area. Now, that's a very specific question about a graph, but what is this graph telling you in total? Just looking at the whole thing, what does it tell you? It tells you that the rainiest seasons in both tend to be different, that it, it rains more in Columbus in the spring than it does in Atlanta, but that you see a higher amount of rain in Atlanta in September and that in December you see a drastic increase in the amount of rain in Columbus. So it gives you an overview of the graph. You can compare the two in general. Now these lines cross over a lot for each other so it's hard to make a real general statement but again those are just examples of what you can see from the graph without giving a specific question. You're just looking at the overall information. What is it giving you that's important? Okay, What's important? The next graph is a pie graph. Um, pretty easy to interpret. If I asked you a specific question, again you have a title here and you have everything labeled so you know what all these colors represent and then you have numbers for each of them but it, it gives you a more visual representation of how much of each thing was uh, found on the beach, the trash that was found on the beach. So if I asked you a specific question, what percentage of the trash on, trash on the beach was plastic, then you'd look that's yellow and you would say 16%. But what if you're trying to be the person who's in charge of cleaning the beach or trying to make the beach less, uh, have less trash on it? How would you look at this graph as a total? If I was looking at this graph as a total, what I would say is, you know, 40% of the stuff we're finding on the beach are cigarettes. So what I could say is something like, well, we need to make smoking illegal. You can't smoke on the beach. If you could, if you could get people to do that, if you have your lifeguard say no smoking, what you would probably find is that the amount of cigarettes on the beach would go down. So you can look at this graph in total. You could also say, well, you know, plastics is still a large portion of it. Maybe if we set up recycling bins, then the number amount of plastic on the beach would go down. 
So those are the kind of things you look at the graph as a total. Again, if you're trying to problem solve or determine what's happening overall, those are the kind of things or the way you would interpret the graph. Oops. All right, another type of graph is a bar graph. Um, this one has a lot of detail on it. Again, it's got a title. Uh, you'll learn this in lab, but, but bar graphs have to start at zero. Uh, you, can't, you can't start at 10 or 20. You have to start at zero and go up in equal increments. Um, each of these are identified, which is good on the x-axis. And then you have a key down here that tells you what color represents what year. So again, I could ask you a very specific question, you know, how many or what percentage of bachelor's degrees were given to women in mathematics in 2010? What you do, 2010 is in the aqua, assuming you're not colorblind, you can tell the difference between these. You would come right here in mathematics in 2010, and you could say that 42 to 43% of the bachelor degrees were given to women in math. Now, you could do that for all these bars, look at them specifically, or you could look at the overall trends. So what overall trends do you see? You see things that a very high percentage of degrees in psychology are given to women, but a very low percentage of bachelor's degrees are given to women in engineering. Also, computer science is low. So again, you're just getting an overall trend here. So if you were somebody who was starting a new program or trying to get women involved in areas where they're currently not getting as many degrees, you would use this graph as a total to say, hey, we need to work on getting more uh, women in engineering and computer sciences. You know, we don't really need to focus on psychology because they're getting the majority of the degrees there. You might also say from this graph, if it's not women, um, if this is the amount of percentage of women, you can figure out the percentage of men. And if you were trying to get uh, men more involved in degrees that they're not as involved in, you would say, hey, here's, a, here's an opportunity to get men. Maybe we need to work on getting more men to get degrees in psychology. So again, that's an overall interpretation, gives you um, some general information that you can use without getting down to the specific nitty gritty of everything. All right, this is a line graph. Um, it's kind of complicated. There's lots of lines here. And again, I could ask you a very specific question. And what this is, and this is a topic we'll talk about, is what percentage of the planted acres are genetically engineered crops in the United States from 1996 to 2013? So this is a great title. You see the axes are identified very easily. You can tell this is years. You can tell this percent of planted acres. And then here are the different types of plants that are genetically modified. I'm not going to get into these. Um, some different types. Uh, the HT makes them resistant to um, uh, weed herbicides. So if you want to get rid of weeds and you don't want to kill the plant, um, genetically modified organisms will not be killed by uh, herbicides. These BT keeps them protected from certain insects. So that, don't worry about that now. We'll get into that in more detail. So again, I could ask you a very specific question. In 2006, what percentage of uh, planted acres of corn or HT corn, you come up here and it's, you know, 37%. Okay. Again, you can get very specific, but you could look at the general trend. So when you look at this graph and you want to make a general interpretation, what do you see? Okay. And what you see is, is that the percentage of planted acres that are genetic of genetically modified organisms has gone up significantly between 1996 and 2012. So again, that's a general interpretation of the graph as opposed to getting very specific. So if you were just interested in the safety of genetically modified organisms, how much they're used, you could use this graph very easily and say, you know, it's going up significantly in the last 20 years or so. Okay, this is just another graph, and this is one we're going to talk about too. Um, a line graph, pretty simple one to interpret. You've got two lines. Um, you've got birth in the thousands, and you look at twin births is the blue line, and trip, triplet births is the red line. Again, I could get very specific in what year, you know, in 1997, how many births per thousands were triplets, were twins. But if you're looking at the general trend here and you want to do a general interpretation, what would you say? What, what sticks out to you and what information do you think is important? What I would look at is to see that twin births have gone up over the years. But 
the big thing I notice is that boom, we see this big increase in triplet births up until this point, and then we see a drastic decrease. So all this does is show you the trends. It doesn't tell you why these trends exist, but it shows you a trend. And as a scientist or as a person, if you're looking at, at information, and it doesn't matter whether it's science information, um, you know, social workers, teachers, everybody, business people are going to be looking at graphs. You know, I might want to look at why do we see that big increase? And then just as importantly, why do we see that big drop? And there is a reason for that. It has to do with fertility clinics. And we'll get into that later in the semester. Okay, what I want to talk about now is a correlations and causation. When you look at two different variables and you see how they are related to each other, you can graph that. Okay. So what I'm going to show you here is one, and this is meant to be not serious, but it's actual data, is we're looking at a line graph here and we're looking at the relationship between the two variables. So here with the black line, they measured how many times I think they measured how many people died of bed sheet tanglings, which, believe it or not, I guess they obviously measure that. So over here is where the black line, the key for the black line is. And you'll see this with a lot of graphs that they have several, um, there, there may be two Y variables that are graphed. So here it shows you the number of deaths due to bed tanglings, bed sheet tanglings per year. Okay? And you'll notice that that goes up. And you'll then the red line, which the key, or not the key, but the variable is over here. The amount that people consume in pounds is the red line that it goes up to. Okay. So there is a relationship between the number of people who died become, by becoming tangled in their bed sheets and the amount of cheese that was consumed. So there is a correlation there. There is a relationship, but it is not causation. Eating cheese does not cause you to be more likely to die because you became tangled in bed sheets. Okay. So a correlation is a relationship between two variables, but it does not mean that one caused the other. Okay. So you have to be clear with that because sometimes companies, medicines and so on, and even companies trying to sell you different things will, will show you a relationship between two things, but it does not mean that one caused the other. Okay. Now, it's not to say maybe, I don't know, there could be some connection between these two that maybe if you consumed more cheese, you weighed more and that might make you more likely to die of bed tangling, but you'd have to do a lot of research to show this causation. Okay, so let's look at another one and this is one that was actually out there. Um, the causes of autism has been pretty controversial over the last 25 years or so. But here we have autism, okay, and here's the individuals diagnosed. And so you see the rate of autism going up. Okay. And you also see that the amount of organic food that was sold went up. And that is on this y axis. So autism rates went up, as did organic food sales. Now, did organic food sales cause the rates of autism to go up? No, they did not. So if you did a study with this, okay, if you did a study with this and you showed that there was a relationship between them, you would then have to go to the next level. You would have to study what about organic food sales. You'd have to get into details to show the specifics of how selling organic food or more people buying organic food led to autism. So again, you see a relationship here, but you don't see causation. If you just heard that noise, my cat just knocked over my, my little thing over there. Um, so just ignore that. Uh, so you, again, you can say there's a relationship, but you can't say causation. Okay. We'll go into autism a little bit. Most of you hopefully know this by now. Vaccines do not cause autism. There was a relationship when kids got vaccines when they were diagnosed with autism but that doesn't mean one caused the other. Vaccines did not cause the autism rate to go up. It just so happened that kids are diagnosed when they're children, when they're young with autism, and that's when they get the vaccines, but they do not cause them. It is a scientific fact that it does not cause them. And that's probably one of the most famous examples of someone saying there's a relationship between these two, a correlation, but there was not causation. 
Okay, just looking at a simple graph here because I'm going to start to get into something a little bit more called statistical significance. And we're going to try to keep that simple. But here you have a line graph, pretty self-explanatory. Malignant melanoma is skin cancer. Malignant means it can travel, it's deadly. And what you see happening here, you got you know four lines here and you just shows the rate okay of skin cancer so a scientist early on who was studying skin cancer would look at this and say hey we're seeing an increase in skin cancer rates then they would start to look at why okay so here is another relationship okay here's another relationship and the relationship here is the number of people that were getting malignant melanoma and the city they lived in and how much UV light they were exposed to in that city. So what it shows is is that the amount of UV light in those cities as it goes up the prevalence of skin cancer goes up. So there's a relationship. If you live in a city that has more UV light your risk of skin cancer goes up. Now this we know is a is a true causation why because several studies have been done since this one to show that uv light exposure does increase your risk of skin cancer so this one study alone did not did not say hey uv light causes skin cancer exposure to uv light causes skin cancer but what they did is they did several studies after this one to show that it was a real causation that yes exposure to uv light does increase your risk of cancer. So there was a consensus among scientists, which means several, several studies were done and they all showed this relationship and that in a lab they can show that UV light, when, ex when cells are exposed to UV light, they mutate and yet and then can cause cancer. So again, you need a consensus. You need a bunch of studies to show the same thing in order for science to work, in order to show a causation. This is just another graph uh, in regards to skin cancer. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because some graphs start to get more confusing. They start to show a line graph here and a bar graph also here. Again, you also notice that they use two um, x-axis here. Here is the rates per 100,000 of males and females that get um, that are diagnosed with skin cancer. Here is the average number of cases per year and here is the age of diagnosis. Um, so it shows that your chances of getting skin cancer, your chances of being diagnosed go up as you get older but then you see a drop here. Uh, the main reason you see a drop here, this sounds kind of cruel, but it's because more people, more people are dead. How many people at 90 are alive to start with? So the number of average cases is going to go down per year just because there's not as many people. So this kind of shows you the combination of a line graph and a bar graph. So you just need to make sure you know what lines mean what and then what side you are looking at. Okay, what side you are looking at for the x-axis when you look at that type of graph. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is something called standard deviation. When you get when you do a study and you get sets of data and you're comparing two sets of data and you get two numbers, are those numbers statistically significant? And I don't want to get into I don't want to get into statistical significance too deeply, but the basic thing I want to tell you is if two numbers are not different enough from each other, then they are not statistically significant and that means there is no difference between the two. So let me give you this example, it might help. Here's a diameter, now it doesn't have this marked very well, but diameter of the tree and then here's your three different trees and then here is a black maple that was raised in full sun and here's a black maple that was raised in partial sun. Same thing for a sugar maple and same thing for a red maple. Now let's look at this sugar maple and you'll see here okay it's probably the average diameter for one that was in partial sun here is the average diameter for one that was raised in full sun now this point is higher than this point but look at these lines these lines represent the standard deviation okay if these lines overlap then there is not a statistical difference between the two so you cannot say for any of these because this one is higher than this one but these lines overlap okay, you can see it best here these lines also overlap so we cannot say for any of these trees 
that the diameter of the tree will go up if it is raised in full sun. So even though this is higher than this, these overlap. If they overlap, there is no statistical significant difference between the two. Even though the numbers are different, statistically there is no difference. Okay. So here's a study on drugs. And when we, we'll talk about the placebo effect and the nocebo effect, and it's very, very interesting. Now, cumulative percentage of, of patients, I don't know the details of what this means, but basically what I, I did some basic research is we want this number to go become more negative, okay, become more negative. So this drug is being tested against the placebo because we want to determine if this drug works, is it better than just taking a placebo where the person thinks they're getting a drug but aren't. So what you see is you see these two lines. What I want you to notice is um, the placebo seems to have a pretty drastic effect on this in a good way. And, here's, and here is the drug. What they don't show you here is they don't show you the standard deviation. If they did this in a way that was easy for you to read, they would have put those little lines with the standard deviation. So from this graph, we can't tell if the drug is any better statistically than the placebo. We can't just say because this number's here that a higher percentage of patients got better is better than the placebo because we can't see the standard deviation and we can't tell whether there's a statistical difference between the two. Okay. So that when you look at this some people say well the drug worked better but you don't know if it worked any better statistically than the placebo. You might be better off taking the placebo because you have less side effects. So that's an example of where they should have used standard deviation but did not. And Two more graphs, okay? This graph shows you, again, a drug and the placebo. And they're looking at pain intensity after having a hemorrhoidectomy, which is basically having a hemorrhoid uh, removed. If you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a big swollen vein in your anus. And that causes hemorrhoids, which can cause bleeding and cause lots of pain. So they can actually remove those. So what they were looking at is pain level. The higher the number here, the more pain. And so in some patients, they gave them a placebo. In other patients, they gave them the drug. And you'll note here, they're looking at the time after the surgery. There was a significant difference between getting the placebo and getting the drug. The drug significantly decreased their pain level because these lines right here do not overlap. Now when you get out time-wise a few days after, then these overlap. There is no difference between the placebo and the drug. Now the thing is here though, the person might not be in pain anymore, so the drug doesn't really have that drastic of an effect. You'll notice this little note up here that 88% of the patients in the placebo group received the rescue medication in the first 24 hours. Why did they do that? Because in the study, early in the study, they saw that the drug made a big difference, a statistical difference, a big difference in how they felt pain-wise. So they said, hey, we can't really make these people suffer um, just because they're in the placebo group. So once they ran this through a bunch of people, they then started, when they saw that their pain level was staying uh, very high compared to the drug group, they would start giving them, they would start giving them the drug just out of humanity and out of ethics so they were not in as much pain. So this is an example of a good graph that shows you standard deviation. Now sometimes they will not use the lines to show you standard deviation, but you'll see this P number. And again, I don't want to get into the details, but the smaller the number, the better. Okay, the smaller the number, the better. Let me write something up here. Okay, so if you see, okay, P is less than 0.05. Okay. That's usually what most scientists are trying to say. If that number is less than 0.05, then the difference between the two, the placebo and the drug, is statistically significant. Okay. Now, the lower this number, I mean, look how low this number is, the more sure you are that there is a difference between the two. Okay, there is a difference between the two. So here, um, again, you've got these lesions, and here is the placebo. So this is the number of lesions that people got on the placebo. This is the number of lesions they got when on these two different types of drugs. And so there is a big difference between these two. 
it's less than 0.05 and it's actually much less than 0.05 so there is a statistical difference between the number of lesions you get on the placebo versus the drug okay so that was just a basic overview of reading graphs and interpreting graphs and statistical significance we'll do some exercises with it there'll be a quiz that'll help you with it if you have any questions you need to let me know